The reaping. When I wake up, the other side of the bed is cold. My fingers stretch out, seeking Prim's warmth, but find only the rough canvas covers of the mattress. She must have had bad dreams and climbed in with our mother. Of course she did. This is the day of the reaping. I prop myself up on one elbow. There's enough light in the bedroom to see them. My little sister, Prim, curled up on her side, cocoon in my mother's body, their chicks pressed together. In sleep, my mother looks younger, still worn, but not so beaten down. Prim's face is as fresh as a raindrop, as lovely as a primrose for which she was named. My mother was beautiful once, too, or so they tell me. Sitting at Prim's knees, guarding her, is the world's ugliest cat. Mashed in nose, half of one ear missing, eyes the color of rotting squash. Prim named him Buttercup insisting that his muddy yellow coat matched the bright flower. He hates me, or at least distrusts me. Even though it was years ago, I think he still remembers how I tried to drown him in a bucket when Prim brought him home. Scrawny kitten, belly swollen with worms, crawling with fleas. The last thing I needed was another mouth to feed. But Prim backed so hard, cried even, I had to let him stay. It turned out okay. My mother got rid of the vermin, and he's a born mouser. Even catches the occasional rat. Sometimes, when I clean a kill, I feed Buttercup the entrails. He stopped hissing at me. Entrails, no hissing. This is the closest we will ever come to love. I swing my legs off the bed and slide into my hunting boots. Supple leather that has molded into my feet. I pull, out, I pull on trousers, a shirt, tuck my long dark braid in, up into a cap, and grab my forge bag. On the table, under a wooden bowl to protect it from hungry rats and cats alike, sits a perfect little goat's cheese wrapped in basil leaves. Prim's gift to me on reaping day. I put the cheese carefully in my pocket as I sleep outside. Our part of District 12, nicknamed the scene, is usually crawling with coal miners heading out to the morning shift at this hour. Men and women with hunched shoulders swollen knuckles, many of whom have long since stopped trying to scrub the coal dust out of their broken nails and the lines of their sunken faces. But today, the black cinder streets are empty. Shutters on the squat gray houses are closed. The ripping isn't until two. May as well sleep late, if you can. Our house is almost at the edge of the scene. I only have to pass a few gates to reach the scruffy field called the meadow. Separating the meadow from the woods in fact, enclosing all of District 12 is a high chain link fence topped with barbed wire loops. In theory, it's supposed to be electrified 24 hours a day as a deterrent to the predators that live in the woods. Packs of wild dogs, lone cougars, bears, that used to threaten our streets. But since we're lucky to get two or three hours of electricity in the evenings, it's usually safe to touch. Even so, I always take a moment to listen carefully for the hum that means the fence is alive. Right now, it's silent as a stone. Concealed by a clump of bushes, I flatten out on my belly and slide under the meter-long stretch that has been loose for years. There are several other weak spots in the fence, but this one is so close to home I almost always enter the woods here. As soon as I'm in the trees, I retrieve a bow and sheath of arrows from a hollow log. Electrified or not, the fence has been successful at keeping the flesh eaters out of District 12. Inside the woods, they roam freely, and there are added concerns like venomous snakes, rabid animals, and no real paths to follow. But there's also food, if you know how to find it. My father knew, and he taught me some ways before he was blown to bits in a mine explosion. There was nothing left of him to bury. I was 11 then. 
Five years later, I still wake up screaming for him to run. Even though trespassing in the woods is illegal and poaching carries the several severest of penalties, most people would more people would risk it if they had weapons. But most are not bold enough to venture out with just a knife. My bow is a rarity, crafted by my father, along with a few others that I keep well hidden in the woods, carefully wrapped in waterproof covers. My father could have made good money selling them, but if the officials found out, he would have been publicly executed for inciting a rebellion. Most of the peacekeepers turn a blind eye to the few of us who hunt, because they are hungry for as fresh meat as anybody is. In fact, they are among our best customers. But the idea that someone might be arming the scene would never have been allowed. In the autumn, a few brave souls sneak into the woods to harvest apples, but always inside of the meadow, always close enough to run back to the safety of District 12 if trouble arises. District 12, where you can starve to death in safety, I mutter. Then I, gl I glance quickly over my shoulder. Even here, even in the middle of nowhere, you worry someone might overhear you. When I was younger, I scared my mother to death, the things that were blurred out about District 12, about the people who rule our country, Panem, from the far-off city called the capital. Eventually, I understood this will only lead to more trouble. So I learned to hold my tongue and turn my features into an indifferent mask so that no one could ever read my thoughts. Do my work quietly in school, make only polite small talk in the public market, discuss little more than trades in the hub, which is the black market where I make most of my money. Even at home, where I am less pleasant, I avoid discussing tricky topics, like the reaping, or food shorta shortages, or the Hunger Games. Prim might begin repeating my words, and then where would we be? In the woods waits the only person with whom I can be myself, Gale. I can feel the muscles in my face relaxing, my pace quickening as I climb the hills to our place, a rock ledge overlooking a valley. A thicket of berry bushes protected from unwanted eyes. The sight of him waiting there brings a smile on me. Gail says I never smile except in the woods. Hey, Katniss, says Gail. My real name is Katniss, but when I first told him, I had barely whispered it, so he thought I'd said catnip. Then, when his crazy lynx started to follow me around, looking for ha handouts, I, it became his official nickname for me. I finally had to kill the links because he scared off game. I almost regretted it because he wasn't that company, but I got a, a decent price for his pelt. Look what I shot. Gail holds up a loaf of bread with an arrow stuck in it, and I laugh. It's real bakery bread, not the flat, dense loaves we make from our grain rations. I take it in my hands, pull out the arrow, and hold the puncture in the crust to my nose, inhaling the fragrance that makes my mouth flood with saliva. Fine bread like this is for special occasions. Mmm, still warm, I say. He must have been at the bakery at the crack of dawn to trade for it. What did it cost you? Just a squirrel. Think the old man was feeling sentiment sentimental this morning, says Gail. Even wished me luck. Well, we are all feeling a bit closer today, aren't we? I say, not even bothering to roll my eyes. Prim left his cheese. I pull it out. His expression brightens at the treat. Thank you, Prim. We'll have a real feast. Suddenly, he falls into a capital accent as he mimics Effie Trinket, the ma maniacally upbeat woman who arrives once a year to read out the names of the reaping. I almost forgot. Happy Hunger Games! He plucks a few berries from the bushes around us. And may the odds, he tosses a berry in a high arc towards me. I catch it in my mouth and break the delicate skin with my teeth. The sweet tartness explodes across my tongue. Be ever in your favor. I finish with equal verve. We have to joke about it because the alternative is to be scared out of our wits. Besides, the capital accent is so affected, almost anything sounds funny in it. I watch as Gil pulls out his knife and slices the bread. He could be my brother. Straight black hair, olive skin, we even have the same gray eyes. But we're not related, at least not closely. Most of the families who work the mind resemble one another this way. That's why my mother and Prim, with their light hair and blue eyes, always look out of place. They are. My mother's parents were part of a small merchant class that caters to officials, peacekeepers, and the occasional seam customer. 
they went on a apothecary shop in a nicer part of District 12. Since almost no one can afford doctors, apothecaries are our healers. My father got to know my mother because on his hunts, he would sometimes collect medicinal herbs and sell them to her shop to be brewed into remedies. She must have really loved him to leave her home for the scene. I try to remember that when all I can see is the woman who sat by, blank and unreachable, while her children turned to skin and bones. I try to forgive her for my father's sake, but to be honest, I'm not the forgiving type. Gail spreads the bread slices with the soft goat's cheese, carefully placing a basil leaf on each while I strip the bushes of their berries. We settle back in a nook in the, ro in the rocks. From this place we are invisible, but have a clear view of the valley, which is teeming with summer life, greens to gather, roots to dig, fish iridescent in the sunlight. The day is glorious, with a blue sky and soft breeze. The food's wonderful, with the cheese seeping into the warm bread and the berries bursting in our mouths. Everything would be perfect if this really was a holiday, if all the day off meant was roaming the mountains with Gale, hunting for tonight's supper. But instead, we have to be standing in the square at two o'clock, waiting for the names to be called. We could do it, you know, says Gail quietly. What, I ask, leave the district, run off, leave in the woods, you and I, we could make it, says Gail. I don't know how to respond. The idea is so preposterous. If we didn't have so many kids, he adds quickly. They're not our kids, of course, but they might as well be. Gail's two little brothers and a sister, Prim, and you might as well throw in our mothers, too. Because how would they live without us? Who would fill those mouths that are always asking for more? With both of us hunting daily, there are still nights when game has to be swapped for lard, or shoelaces, or wool. Still nights when we go to bed with our stomachs growling. <sighs> I never want to have kids, I say. I might, if I didn't leave here, says Gail. But you do, I say, irritated. Forget it, he snaps back. The conversation feels all wrong. Leave? How could I leave Prim, who is the only person in the world I'm certain I love? And Gail is devoted to his family. We can't leave, so why bother talking about it? And even if we did, even if we did, where did the stuff about having kids come from? There's never been anything romantic between Gail and me. When we met, I was a skinny 12-year-old, and although he was only two years older, he already looked like a man. It took a long time for us to even become friends, to stop haggling over every trade and begin helping each other out. Besides, if he wants kids, Gail won't have any trouble finding a wife. He's good-looking, he's strong enough to handle the work in the mines, and he can hunt. You can tell by the way girls whisper about him when he walks by in the school that they want him. It makes me jealous, but not for the reasons you would think. Good hunting partners are hard to find. What do you want to do, I ask. We can hunt, fish, or gather. Let's fish at the lake. We can leave our poles and gather in the woods. Get something nice for tonight, he says. <laughs> tonight. After the reaping, everyone's supposed to celebrate. And a lot of people do, out of relief that the, their children has been spared for another year. But at least two families would pull their shutters, lock their doors, and try to figure out how they will survive the painful weeks to come. Um, the chapter's not done here, but I'm gonna finish because it's almost 14 minutes and YouTube can't handle big videos. Um, I'll continue reading next time. Just let me know if you prefer me to continue reading, like, in this voice, or if you want me to whisper it, like, if you think it's more relaxing, or if you actually want to hear the story behind it. Um, I think I'm gonna just read the first demon, um, chapter first to see if you guys like it or not. And then if you do want me to continue reading, I'll just read the entire book book or just the main chapters. I'm not sure yet how I'm going to do this. Just let me know what you think. Okay, bye.